Ja. Ja. Okay. Good evening, folks. Sorry about the glitches we are having today. Uh, today's uh, program starting a little late because we had some difficulties in live webcast. Uh, so we invited some people on Zoom, and we'll record this uh, talk and post it on YouTube later. Uh, so rest of the people can watch later. Uh, I'll give a brief introduction to Varaha Mira Science Forum, then hand over to Ramanan for an introduction to the speaker. And then the speaker will give us the lecture of the day. <clears throat> Varaha Mehra Science Forum. This is our website, uh, varahamehrasf.blogspot.com. It has a listing of all the previous programs that we have hosted, uh, invitations, descriptions, and the videos, or uh, you know, links to the videos of all the programs that we have hosted. So please do check it out. Um, we are on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. It's just search for. Uh, Varaha Mehra Science Forum, and you'll find us on Facebook and on YouTube. As for Twitter, these are some of the contacts. So you can just uh, note down this number. You can message any one of us and do it. And, or you can you know, ask, a, put a comment on Facebook or something, and then we'll get back to you with that. And then you can join. There's both a discussion group and an event notification group on WhatsApp. So one of the things we wanted to do when we started the Science Forum was to have not just a place where we sh you know, deliver lectures, but I have a social media presence where people who attend the lectures and have an interest in science can I have a forum where they discuss and it's been going strong. The WhatsApp group is very, very active. It's much more active than even the Facebook uh, page. Why did we start this? About four years back, we wondered uh, that was the time when Madras had been recognized as, the, uh, you know, it's always had a reputation as the cultural capital of India. And we'd had a UNESCO recognition recently as uh, some, you know, music city and so on. And one aspect of the cultural, of course, we have festivals, we have this Carnatic Music Festival, we have uh, uh, all kinds of other things happening. Um, you know, we are a major center for uh, Medicare, tourism, Mahabali Buram attracts so many people and so on. But we thought it's not just that art and uh, science, art and, uh, you know, language and literature and music, but science too is part of our culture. Uh, and why are we not celebrating that? There are popular lectures. Uh, in Madras, not just technical lectures for the technical audience, but uh, popular lectures too, and they, but they are few and far between. So we want to have a forum where we host uh, popular lectures on a monthly basis. And that's how this effort started. Uh, there are seminars, of course. There are seminars are conducted by various medical uh, colleges or hospitals, uh, engineering colleges, companies, and so on. But they're generally too technical and they are almost invariably, you know, for an invitation body, they are not for the general public. So we wanted one where uh, both professionals and amateurs could meet, mingle and discuss some things. And that is why we started this forum. So one of the key objectives was to build a community using social media. And that's why we posted the YouTube videos on YouTube. We have this very active WhatsApp group and so on. Besides the science, we are interested not just in the science, but also the personalities and the story behind those personalities. What motivated them? Uh, what kindled their passion? Why did they do something? Why did it take so long? Why did it, why could they do it so fast? Who helped? You know, who was a hindrance? Uh, why here? Why somewhere? Why not somewhere else? And so on. So uh, the story is really very interesting in most cases. We have very little stories. We have you know legendary things about. Uh, Newton sitting under an apple tree or James Watt watching a kettle boil, tea kettle boil. Uh, that's really it. But the actual stories of science are actually totally fascinating. And so the other thing, because we were going for popular speak, popular uh, audience and we are not just going for a technical audience, we wanted both style and substance. And so we wanted both amateur, amateur and professional speakers. And we've, in the last four years, we've had a very good mix of both speaking. We even had professional speak in fields that are not their profession. Uh, that's also uh, turned out very well. It's almost entirely a non-profit amount. We, we've had donations from people. Uh, uh, we started off uh, with donations from the participants. Then we uh, continued with a lot of donations from uh, very good sponsors and pe people like that. So um, more, all our events are free. They are open for the public. Any host, volunteer, uh, sponsors are more than welcome. This is our YouTube channel, Varaha Bira Science Forum. There are more than 40 videos there. Um, we have all the lectures, the past are there. We've even had some lectures in Tamil, and we want to expand that the volume of those also. 
the demand for us that has been, has been few uh, and not too much repeat audience. We also wanted to host lectures at other venues and places. And if there is ever uh, if there is a request, we've had some requests and we are doing some of those. If it gets consistent, we will do that. Um, this is not new. We have had uh, heritage uh, science societies before. This Bertrand Russell Society operated in the 60s. Uh, I know that because this is in my family photo collection with my father there. Uh, IIT hosts popular lectures. We had Arvind Gupta speak. We had the cosmonaut Rakesh Sharma speak. We had field medalist Manjul Bhargava speak at the Kupasami Sastri Research Institute on Sanskrit and Mathematics. Arvind, sir, Arvind Gupta, we had the pleasure of hosting him in our program also. We had uh, the KV Sharma Foundation hold the Bhaskaracharya workshop uh, in Mailapur. We had uh, Rao, CNR Rao, the Bharat Ratna, speak about Lavoisie. We had uh, uh, Ekam Renivas, the house of the Aladi family, hosts lecture, regular lectures uh, you know, once, or, once a year or so. Uh, Math Science Institute has started uh, doing, uh, they didn't do it this year because, you know, almost this year it's been a lockdown kind of thing. But they started this uh, Science at the Sabha kind of uh, program a few years back and they've gone for it for three, four years. So there are other programs. And there are other events also, like the Brilla Planetarium in Kotrupuram organized uh, Venus Transit in 2012, 2004, and, uh, and uh, Mercury Transit also when that happened. Uh, they regularly host evening uh, telescope viewings and so on. There are other amateur groups that are do, do stuff, uh, very scientific scientific stuff. Uh, we take pride in that uh, Madras is one of the few cities from which you can watch a live rocket launch. Uh, go to the roof. This picture on the left is my, you know, literally my terrace. You can see a rocket take off from Sri Rikota. One on the right is a tall building, the Anna Centenary Library, and you know, from one of those windows. So, you know, what more could you ask for? Um, besides our lectures, we also had uh, the pleasure of conducting a few courses, uh, just, uh, you know, courses for the general public, not very specific, specified ones, specific uh, technical ones, specialty ones. I hosted a, a series of courses on, a series of classes on Indian astronomy and mathematics. The most recent one was in June. This one was from February. We had four batches of those and we'll probably offer them again in the future. Followed, that was followed by Badri Sashadri offering uh, courses on a particular uh, aspects of Indian mathematics. He did a five-day course on Kutaka, which is what which is Aryabhata's term for linear indeterminate equations, a very important part of Indian mathematics. And then followed it up with Bhavana and Chakravala, which are Brahmagupta and Bhaskara's terms for finding solutions to quadratic indeterminate equations, a problem that later challenged other mathematicians like uh, Ferma and Euler who also contributed significantly to that. So those are things that we have done. Um, we've had lectures in several fields. We had a lecture on weather and climate and Sangam poetry by a meteorologist, some references to you know, uh, uh, climate events and things like that. We had Darwin Gupta speak about science through toys. We had Dr. Uttara Dharirajan speak about the women scientists of India. Uh, we had a geologist talk about, because we don't rarely talk about geology, it's usually physics, chemistry, biology, but we had a geologist talk about wandering rivers and cruising coastlines. The, not the prehistoric uh, development of uh, such uh, geological events, but even in historic times, and what we can gain from our literature and understand you know, how the rivers have changed, how the sea lines have changed. Uh, I'll come to uh, biology and life sciences, which is just list a few of the lectures that we have uh, presented on that. Badri has spoken about single helix, double helix, and triple helix, the discovery of these three very important uh, biochemicals, uh, with one contribution from an uh, Indian uh, of note. This was one of the earliest programs. It was a second lecture. Uh, we had Sivaraman speak about the hidden phases of medical history, which is about 20, 30 years before antibiotics became uh, known and common. We had something called bacteriophages, which still exist and uh, are, have a you know, useful medical function. So there was a talk about the discovery, their use, and then uh, later how the antibiotics kind of overwhelmed uh, this particular science of study. We had a wonderful lecture by Professor Dayanandan, who's a botany professor at Madras Christian College. He talked about evolution and its grand heritage. I, is, uh, I, you know, I urge you to go look at that video. It's a wonderful one. We had a talk about nature, Indian monsoon. Shashwat gave a brief talk about it. We had a lecture by a, a biologist on uh, nutrition and food and you know how we grow crops and what we eat and how we cook them and how we have changed in our culture, how culture affects it. Uh, this was one of the few lectures that we had in Tamil. Uh, we had a talk uh, by Ramanan, who is one of our co-hosts now, about CRISPR, the gene editing tool that has come into uh, such popularity of, of late. The biotechnology industry has boomed in the last few years. 
and this is a talk about uh, crispr uh, we had a talk about uh, neuroscience and its history by nishant chandrashekar um ramana again about uh, just, just after the corona lockdown we entered the lockdown we talked about the spread of viruses and information r0 pandemic how the spread spread what we do to control it all that not just viruses but also other things uh we had uh, samant subramanyam the author uh, on a book on jbs haldane talk about that famous biologist and uh, that was in august and we had pranay lal talk about thar desert not biology per se but a natural history of the thar desert uh, that was in june and so today we have uh, dr ravi chellam uh, an expert on uh, ecology and conservation and he'll be giving us this talk today on ecology and conservation of asiatic lions with that i will pass it on to uh, ramanan to introduce the speaker of the day yeah thanks gopu uh, good evening everyone uh, our speaker of the day dr ravi chellam is a ceo of metastring foundation and director of the mission secretariat of the preparatory phase project of the national mission on biodiversity and human well being that's a that's a long job description thank you and uh, going back uh, dr ravi chellam has been involved with uh, wildlife and biodiversity research education and conservation since the early 1980s that is when i was i was in school okay so that's a long long time and he has a masters degree in wildlife biology from abc college baridasan university and a doctorate from saurashtra university based on his work on the ecology of asiatic lions uh, without much ado i request uh, dr ravi chellam to give his talk on uh, ecology and conservation of asiatic lions thank you sir thank you very much let me share my screen <clears throat> it's coming through okay there Good. it is so um i plan to spend about an hour um basically describing uh what i have studied understood and been engaging with since 1985 which is the ecology and conservation of the asiatic lions i am a wildlife biologist and conservation scientist by training but in the last 10 15 years taken on more uh, institutional roles and uh, we are also involved in this new initiative as part of the biodiversity collaborative which is the national mission on biodiversity and human welfare well being a few pictures to set the tone about the beast that I, we are going to be focusing on very often when we talk of lions the image that comes to our mind is of africa most indians do not associate lions with india we think of tigers we think of elephants we might even think of leopards snakes cobras and so on and so forth and it's not unusual for me at the end of a session like this for somebody from the audience to say by the way what did you tell us about the tiger i mean after having seen images and listened to me for about an hour in their mind the lion transforms into a tiger obviously for me because of my long association and hopefully by the end of the talk you will also appreciate how one why the lion is unique in so many ways compared to a lot of other wildlife species that we have in india this is obviously an adult male lion very distinct earlier picture was of young cubs about 4 5 months old a subadult male lion i'm just showing these pictures because these are atypical pictures most pictures of lions uh, from india are somewhat staged they are, because they used to be a tourist attraction called a lion show when lions were baited and they would come to the road and people would take these pictures many of these pictures are taken by me Uh, so uh, some of them are contributed by photographer friends and these are not necessarily taken in a touristy setting lions spend a lot of time resting especially during the day and they typically use shady spots like this to rest and that also in some sense gives them a bad reputation and it's not unusual for people to refer to them as lazy lions 
The other question that often is asked of me is, what is the difference between lions of Africa and lions found in India? Half jokingly, and probably the most truthful answer I can give is, when you see wild lions in and around Gir, those are Asiatic lions. When you see lions in Africa, those are African lions. Simply because there is no distinct characteristic that will enable us to distinguish for most definitively between Asian and African lions. There are a few clues. One is this uh, fold skin hanging along the belly called the belly fold. Very distinct in Asiatic lions, universal in its presence. All Asiatic lions have the belly fold. But the complication is about 50% of African lions also have a belly fold. So the absence of the belly fold tells you it's an African lion. The presence of it doesn't necessarily confirm whether it's African or Asian. But the other thing that you can see in Asian lions is the top of the head. The mane is not very luxuriant. So you can see the ears always distinctly. About 50, 60% of the African lions, the mane is really luxuriant like a haystack and you will not see the ears. So if the mane is luxuriant, you do not see the ears, it's definitely an African lion. But if the mane is sparse like this, it could either be African or Asian. There is also one or two populations of African lions where the males do not have manes. So there are maneless male African lions. But one of the most distinct features of the Asiatic lions is these are forest animals. Much of what we know from Africa of the African lions is from what are called as scrub and savanna habitats, mixture of grassland, open plains, and bits of forest. But our lions live in forests. Now, so far, I've largely been showing you images of male lions. This is an image of a lioness, the female of the species. And one thing special about lions is that they are sexually dimorphic. By that, I mean, when you look at a male, you clearly know it is a male. There is no doubt in your mind that it's a male. And even when you look at a female, you know very clearly these are females. This is the most distinctly dimorphic species of cats. When you look at a tiger, when you look at a leopard, when you look at a snow leopard, it does require some effort and expertise to be able to determine the sex of the animal. You need to look under the tail, you need to be familiar with the size of the animal, the size of its head and so on. Here are a lioness with a couple of young cubs, again, three or four months old. Another lioness with three cubs. The other distinct feature of lions is that lions are social. They are the only species of cats which are social. All other cats live solitary life. Occasionally, occasionally when they mate, you will obviously see the male and female together. But lions, by definition, are social. But the picture I'm just now showing is not to convey their social organization because it's not your typical human-like family. Here in the foreground, you see a male. In the background, you see a female. And in between, you see a couple of cubs. So it is not as if it's a father, mother, and children kind of social organization. A group of lions is called a pride. And this is what the picture now illustrates a typical social unit of lions. A pride of lions consists of females of various ages and their dependent young. Male lions do not form part of the pride. Pride can range quite widely in size, especially if they've had litters, they will quite be a boom if four or five females have had young, the size of the pride can more or less overnight increase by 10, 15 animals. Here, you see an adult female here, there's one more adult female, 
and there's an adult female in the background. These, this is about two years old, subadult. These are all about a year plus, and then you see younger cubs also. So multi-generational social unit. Now, this is, look carefully, this is a map of Africa, then you see Arabia, and then West Asia, and then India. Lions evolved in Africa. They did not evolve in India. Through a process of natural dispersal, these lions moved through the land bridge and came all the way to India. In today's world, there are only two subspecies of lions, Panthera leo leo and Panthera leo melanochaita. The melanochaita subspecies is restricted to East and Southern Africa. The leo subspecies is found in West, Central Africa and also in Asia. Till these genetic studies established that there are only two subspecies of lions, the Asiatic lions used to be called Panthera leo persica or lions of Persia. In this map, Africa is kind of blurred out. This is the Red Sea, so anything left of that is Africa. But the focus is on Asia, the former distribution of lions in Asia. As you can see, Syria, what are today Syria, Iraq, Iran, Pakistan, much of North and Central India, and some questionable records from the former USSR and Afghanistan, constitutes the distribution of lions in Asia, the former distribution of lions in Asia largely due to human action, which is hunting, modification and change of habitat, the lions today are restricted to Saurashtra Peninsula of Gujarat state, that too primarily in gear forest and surrounding habitats. But do keep in mind that lions in Asia and especially in India had a much larger distribution than just gear forest. How were we able to come up with this map? How were we able to generate these maps? Largely through hunting and shikar records, going through historical natural history notes, and thereby being able to reconstruct this distribution. Here is a table that gives you a sense of the lion population in and around Gir Forest. I urge you not to pay too much attention to the accuracy of these numbers, but just look at the trend because the accuracy is always questionable. Even today, uh, the numbers that the Indian government gives us, uh, you need to take with a pinch of salt, not just with lions, but with most other wildlife species also, and I'll explain why. But the important take home message from this slide is if you look at the late 1800s till about 1920, the lions in Gir very nearly went extinct. I doubt whether the lions were ever less than 12 or less than 20, but they should have been very low in numbers. And they have significantly increased to the extent that last year's count put the lion population at 674. This graph, Two important take home messages. One is the increase in lion numbers. And the counts are done every five years. So if you go back, 1990 was the 284 count, 95 was 304, 2000, 2005, 2010, 15, and 2020. So steady and between the last five years, 15 and 20, quite a significant increase. The other number that we need to track is the one in pink. It says 6,600 and then it goes up to 3,000. Uh, that is the area in which these lines are found. And please keep these two numbers in your mind because they become important as we go through the line story. So the line population as per official estimates is 674 and the lion distribution as per official estimates is 30,000 square miles. The square kilometers, sorry.
National Park. The National Park is the central dark green and the surrounding light green is the wildlife sanctuary. Let us refer to this together as the gear protected area. And the gear protected area is roughly 1500 square kilometers. So the protected area is only 1500 square kilometers, but lions are found over 30,000 square kilometers, which means the vast majority of the lion distribution is unprotected. Largely human dominated habitats with small patches of natural vegetation or human planted uh, plantation forests. In India, the legislation that protects wildlife is called the Wildlife Protection Act. Under the Wildlife Protection Act, there are several categories of protected area. And one of the strictest category is that of a national park. A national park basically says there should be no human presence or activity. It is completely for wild nature. While in wildlife sanctuaries, there is some element of human activity that is allowed. And of course, throughout India, no hunting is legally allowed. So any hunting that takes place is actually poaching. It's illegal. The Gir forest, apart from being the home for the lions, the only population of wild lions in Asia, has a wonderful diversity of vegetation, a whole host of other types of wildlife, ranging from reptiles to birds to all kinds of other mammals. Equally importantly, it's a very important source of water for the entire Saurashtra Peninsula. And as you can see, there are multiple dams which are primarily used for drinking water and irrigation. There are about seven perennial rivers draining through the forest and flowing out. And hence, not just as a wildlife habitat and uh, a natural ecosystem, but as a provider of very essential ecosystem services, uh, the gear forest is very, very critical. This is what the forest looks like. It is not a flat savanna. But if you're watching lion uh, videos from Africa in Discovery and so on, Natural Geographic, this is actually a series of low hills. It's forested. This is a picture taken in summer. So bulk of the trees have shed their leaves, but you can still see plenty of green trees. Normally there would be species of ficus like banyan tree and so on and so forth on people. There are many species of ficus or trees found along rivers. Uh, the riverine vegetation tends to be evergreen. When you go inside the forest, this is what it looks like. Dominated by teak, stunted teak. You can be familiar with the teak in South India. Um, you know, much more robust, much taller, much thicker tree grows here because of rainfall. Um, gear gets much less of rainfall and a lot of thorny species. So to walk silently through these forests is quite a challenge because the plenty of leaf litter, you tend to make quite a bit of noise. As we go east, the habitat tends to resemble a savanna. The canopy is much more open. It's much more lower. That's primarily because the rainfall is also lesser. The Western gear receives about 900 millimeters of rainfall. And Eastern gear receives only about 650 millimeters of rainfall. We talked about perennial rivers. Here is an example of one, the Hiran River which flows by Sasan, which is the park headquarters. And it's a quite an unusual picture, a lion in water. Lion, unlike tigers and jaguars, tend to avoid water in the sense they are not quite comfortable putting their feet into it. They obviously need water to drink, but tigers and jaguars would actually quite happily lie in water to cool off. And jaguar, in fact, consistently hunts uh, prey for, uh, aquatic prey uh, and Tigers tend to drag their prey into water. Lions seldom do that. The monsoon is a great driver of the ecosystem in Gil. If you noted all the earlier pictures, the colors were brown, gray, and yellow. With the first rains, there's a magical transformation taking place. The 
grass and the leaves just grow very, very rapidly and the whole landscape is lush green. This lasts at best for about two to three months, depending on the quantity of rain, uh, the consistency of the rain. The first rains come there about early July and with luck would last till about end of September. I mentioned how the lions of gear are forest animals. This is again a good illustration of that. Here are massive ficus trees and you can see in the shade a pride of lions are resting. Lions are not the only large cats that live in gear. They coexist with leopards. Leopards, of course, coexist with lions, as well as tigers in India, as well as lions in Africa. How is this possible? What enables two species of large cats to coexist? It's primarily the leopard's ability to be arboreal or be able to access spaces in trees. Leopard, by its body size, typically about 50 to 60 percent of that of a lion or a tiger. And its great agility is very, very comfortable on trees, not just to rest, but also to take up their kills. Supposing they've killed a deer or a pig or a monkey, they'll happily take it up a tree. They will put it on a fork and feed off a tree. I've also seen videos Yeah, uh, Ravi's connection, I think, is lost. <clears throat> Let me check. Ah, yeah, it's back. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. You suddenly, you know, you were frozen for a few a couple of minutes. Uh, my internet keeps saying it's un unstable. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, the leopard is just completely comfortable in trees and its survival depends on it. I have seen more than half a dozen times, leopards scooting up a tree and then noticing that there were a couple of lions chasing it. And lions would stay down, growl, try to climb a tree, but they're too big to be able to do that, too heavy to be able to do that. And the leopard is literally shivering because it knows the consequences if it is caught on ground. I have seen at least on two occasions, leopards that had been killed and fed upon by lions. And I've again seen videos and uh, natural history records of tigers also doing the same with leopards. If the leopards get a chance, they will kill the lion cubs. Unguarded lion and tiger cubs would be killed by leopards. But the chances of that happening are quite rare because tigers and lions, especially lions, because they are group living, social animals, very seldom would the cubs be left unguarded. So I use the term large cats. What do we mean by large cats? Typically, large cats weigh at least 18 kilograms. They are exclusively carnivorous, which means meat eating. They use space. They really move a lot. A lion on a typical day would, especially a male lion on a typical day, would move eight to 10 kilometers on an average. I have recorded a male line moving 32 kilometers overnight. That's because of the size of their territories. Male lines occupy territories of 100 square kilometers or more, and hence they need to move a lot. All large cats are territorial, which means they defend their space, and large cats can roar. Uh, other species of cats cannot roar, and off the roaring, Lions are the ones which roar the best and roar very regularly. Uh, India is very lucky in that we have five species of large cats. Clouded leopard, which is found in the Northeast. Snow leopard, which is found in the high mountains of the Himalayas. Common leopard, which is found through most of India 
from Rajasthan to Arunachal Pradesh to Kanyakumari and till about 10,000 feet in the Himalayas. The tiger and of course the lion. I can't think of any other country, any other political entity having five species of large cats. So we are blessed in many ways. On top of this, we have something like 12, 15 species of small cats. Uh, so very, very large diversity of cat species. The other magic about India is our large cats, especially lions, tigers, and leopards, live with people. Here in Gir, there is a resident population of local people called Maldaris, who are livestock graziers. And here you see a couple of them on a camel, which is their beast of burden, I mean, the way they travel. And what do they do? They graze cattle, primarily buffaloes, a few cows, an occasional horse, and one or two camels. That's what a typical herd would consist of. And they live in these thorn enclosed settlements called nesses. And at night, they will plug the opening with these thorn, bunches of thorn, to protect, to keep the lions and leopards away. They live a pretty simple life no running water, no electricity. So all the nesses are located close to a perennial source of water because both people and their lives need lots of water. And during daytime, they take the herds out to graze in the forest and use the water that's available in the forest to um, bring all the livestock, to keep them cool, to wash them and so on. It's largely a peaceful coexistence in the sense the Maldaris know the lions are around, the leopards are around, so they are quite vigilant. They take steps to protect their livestock, but they also lose livestock on a regular basis. But there is an acceptance of this loss. They know that the cost of living in the forest is losing occasional livestock to lion predation. But the benefits of living in the forest in terms of availability of grass and forage and water and space far outweighs the cost that they have to pay. Very hardworking people. This is a picture I had taken very early in the morning, something like 3.30, 4 o'clock. Here they are churning curds to produce butter. All of their labor is manual. The butter is converted into ghee. And that is the product of commerce that they take into the, for, into the local uh, market to sell. I did my field work between 85 and 90 when their economy was largely barter based. They would take the produce to the market, which is ghee, and in exchange, they would get food materials for themselves as well as cattle feed and so on and so forth. But now, uh, in 85 to 90 is what, 30 years ago at least, and now you see quite significant changes. Uh, instead of camels, most people have motorbikes. Instead of them converting to ghee, now refrigerated trucks from nearby dairies come collect liquid milk twice a day. And th this means they're getting far better economic benefits. And in that sense, it's, it's a good thing for them. As I said, lions are carnivorous. And their primary prey are deer, antelopes, wild pig, porcupines, monkeys, which are wild species found in Gir. The most common prey species is spotted deer or cheetah, which is the photograph that you see. And the most preferred prey species is the samba deer, the largest deer species. Here is a picture of a well-fed lion, and I say well-fed simply because if you look, you can see how protruding the abdomen is. But the objective of showing this picture is really to focus on its canine teeth, the two sharp, long teeth that you see in the lower jaw of the animal. Each lion has two pairs of canine teeth, one in the upper jaw and one in the lower jaw. 
these are very, very important, essential tools for these lions. Without the canine teeth, they cannot kill. They use the canines to either strangulate the animal, the prey animal, by biting the throat or slicing the spine by biting the top of the neck or sometimes clamping down on the nostrils to suffocate the animal. The canine are extremely sharp, long, pointed teeth and very, very essential. Either through accident or through old age, the canines will get blunted, will get broken, and that will begin, uh, that indicates a beginning of the decline of the individual animal. Uh, apart from canine, the other important tool the lions have, and this is not well seen in this picture, or its four paws. I'll later on show you pictures to highlight uh, the size of the paws. The paws are what enables an animal to, uh, a lion to grab its prey. No prey is sitting and waiting to be killed. Even when surprised, ambushed at very close quarters, the prey animal would attempt to run away. And the lion possesses an advantage in the first 200 to 300 meters in that it can outrun uh, most of its prey species. So if a prey has a bit of a lead and is able to sustain a high speed flight for about 300 meters, it can escape. Uh, but as a lion approaches a running prey animal, it reaches out with one or both its four paws to hook it because the claws are there or to trip it. And once the prey animal falls down, it'll immediately try and grab it by the throat or the neck or the nostril. This is what a pair of lions can do to a prey animal. This is the remains of a cheetah. And you can see the skull there, the neck bones, the lower jaw. And these are the chewed down antlers. Deer shed their antlers every year. So for about six months, they have antlers. And for about six months, the antler is regrowing. And when it's regrowing, it's soft, not hard like bone, which the real, once the antler is fully formed, it is. But these soft antlers are called in velvet. These are extremely nutritious, very highly vascularized, and the lions have even chewed and completely fed on it. Rest of the carcass, you can see a bit of the backbone here, the rib cage, the collarbone, the shoulder bone here, and one more limb. This is just to tell you how efficient they are in utilizing the prey. I had radio collared animals, and I'll come to it in a bit. So I was following these two male lions for about 12 days. For when I saw them first, in the beginning of this long term follow, I, the lions were well fed and they did not hunt anything substantive for the first 10 days. At about five o'clock, it was a winter's day, so, and it's west of India, so the sunrise is quite late. At about 5 a.m., I heard some noise inside the forest, and it was dark, so I was not going to venture in. And this is a picture taken more or less at first light. I've killed and completely fed and cleaned up a big cheetal male. And then cheetal stag would have weighed something like at least 70 to 80 kilograms, of which two thirds would have been edible. So we're talking something like 50 kilograms of meat. So two male lions have been able to feed uh, on this carcass uh, in a couple of hours. Close up pictures of lions feeding. Here you see a male lion applying its modified molar teeth, what are called as carnassials. See, molar teeth, typically we have molar teeth, cows have molar teeth, deer have molar teeth. Massive teeth used for grinding. But lions don't need to grind any food. But they do need to cut chunks of meat from the carcass to be able to feed on them. They don't have knives and forks to do the um, processing. So 
the paws hold the carcass, the carnal seals cut the meat uh, from the carcass and they just swallow. There is no tasting or chewing, they just swallow chunks of meat. And here is a good illustration of the size of the paws and the paws here are contracted in the sense that this can expand at least 50% in size. And when it expands, the claws come out. Unlike in dogs, cats can retract their claws. And by that, I mean the claws go inside a sheath, which means when they are walking, they don't come in touch with the ground. The dog, if when you hear a dog walk on a, a hard surface, you can hear their claws hitting uh, the ground. So they are blunt. In cats, the claws are always sharp and it's very essential for the claws to be sharp for them to hunt. Unlike dogs, lions can also shift, can move their paws and that's what enables them to reach out and hunt and bring down their prey. A picture of a lion feeding on a cheeto. And here, a pride of lions feeding on a cheeto. If you look carefully, you can see the cheeto carcass there. There's one adult female, there's another adult female. These are all about a year old uh, cub uh, feeding on. Here is a lone lioness feeding on a Nilgai. Nilgai is uh, Asia's largest species of antelope. And uh, these antelopes would weigh something in the region of 300 kilograms. So you're talking of very, very large animals. And this, if you look carefully, you will see a band, dark brown band around the neck, which is a radio collar. So this is a female I had radio collared. So I knew its weight. It was about 108 kilograms. And she alone was able to successfully hunt a Nilgai male weighing something like 300 kilograms. It gives you a sense of the hunting ability and its efficiency. And the only reason I'm saying this is because lions in India have very poor public relations. As I mentioned earlier, lions are often referred to as lazy or domesticated and not wild compared to leopards and tigers. This is primarily because between 1952 and 87, for about 30, 35 years, lions were baited for tourists to come and see. So the buffalo would be tied close to a road a lion or more would come, sit around. Uh, two or three forest guards would be there. They will protect the buffalo, but the tourists can come and see the lion. Lions got used to this process. Once a week or once in two weeks, the buffalo would be given to them. So they feel it's worthwhile to wait. But the tourist doesn't know this. So they come and expect a lion to be wild in the sense, immediately growl at you, charge at you, attack you, and so on. <laughs> So in their mind, seeing a buffalo calf tied just with two or three guards defending it and a group of lions hardly 10 meters away gave the impression that these are not wild animals. Several of us campaigned simply because that's not the right way to present our wildlife. And people interested in wildlife, including tourists, when they come to a wildlife habitat, have to come with their minds, ears, nose, eyes fully open for a holistic wilderness experience and not just focus on certain charismatic species. By this, I mean ability to listen to bird song, insect calls, animal calls, to smell the forest, to hear the wind, you know, whole host of things, to observe plants and flowers and reptiles and insects and so Our wilderness has so much to offer. Why wilderness? Even in our cities, if we are observant, there is so much that we can see of wild nature. Fortunately, in 87, they stopped the lion shows. And since then, at least for normal tourists, there's no baiting. I'm told when VIPs come like the president of the country or something, there is still some baiting going on. But lions don't just kill wild prey. There is thousands of domestic livestock those of the Maldaris, as well as local livestock graziers from surrounding villages who bring in livestock to graze in the forest. Additionally, 
you have hundreds of lions living in human dominated habitats and they are largely living off domestic animals here you see a group of lions feeding on a domestic buffalo till now i have primarily talked about and shown images of lions within the protected area here is a lioness having killed and fed on a cow but this is not within the forest this is outside in a village these lions tend to be very different in their interaction with people in their behavior simply because they are much more disturbed by people especially now with the ubiquitous cell phone and camera phones people think you know oh lion and so on and the videos i'll show will give you a sense of what i'm trying to communicate here there have been unfortunately one or two cases where people on a motorbike saw a lion by the roadside and thought it was good enough to go creep up and take a selfie and clearly the lion did appreciate it and the person got attacked that's a worst case scenario but lions in general tend to be far more nervous uh, a little more aggressive outside the forest than inside the forest i have used the collective noun pride for lions and i told you it's a group of females and their dependent young prides vary quite dramatically in size obviously the minimum size for a pride would be 2 and it can go up to 40 and maybe even 50 it depends on the number of young cubs but the 40 50 size prides are rare typically large prides would be in the region of 20 to 25 animals uh in gear they tend to be smaller uh in the region of 8 to 10 uh animals the males are called coalitions they live in groups called coalitions and their size can range from 2 to 7 males and they are typically unrelated to the pride please note the core of a pride is a bunch of related females while the coalition of males is unrelated to the pride and this is evolution operating imagine if the males were also related to the females the situation would lead to inbreeding decrease in fitness and generally survival uh, everything becomes a problem so the tenure of a male coalition in a pride is restricted with lock and gear it can extend to 4 or 5 years uh, on an average in africa it is seen to be about 3 years so the males are turning over every 3 to 5 years there's a change in the coalition of males while most females stay exactly in the same territory in which they are born here are a couple of male lions sleeping again a good uh, image to show the size of those paws again these are not uh, expanded paws these are contracted paws with the claws uh, retracted um, and the other Im amazing thing about these animals are this is a wide angle picture taken by me on foot literally standing hand shaking distance from these animals uh, this is not any sign of my bravery or anything like that but it's more to do with the behavior of these animals uh, if you know what you're doing if you are careful these lions at least in the 80s used to give amazing access uh, we had to be careful we had to be careful not just to look after ourselves but equally importantly not to disturb these animals when they are going about their life but uh, while they are sleeping he is of course keeping an eye on me told you lions male lions live in coalitions this is three males out of a large coalition of five males coalition males don't necessarily always have to be found uh, together in the same group uh, sometimes you can find them together sometimes you can see them uh, uh, find them uh, independently uh, so this five male coalition uh, out to the hundreds of times i saw 
only about half a dozen times I saw all five males together. But I had the ability to identify these animals and I'll explain that how in a bit. And so I, each animal I saw, I took pains to identify, I knew who was who, where is he supposed to be, who is he uh, normally with and so on and so forth. All very important when you do long-term uh, animal behavior studies. I did my field work from December of 1985 to March of 1990, so a little over about four and a half years. And I got to know about 60 to 80 animals uh, by uh, individual identification. A series of images to tell you not of the same, uh, same uh, individuals, but just to give you an image, uh, a kind of a visual uh, feel of how these animals look as they grow up. Here you see young cubs, roughly about four months old, about a year old, and here you see these three-year-olds um, close to being an adult. So indicating the development in how they look, their size, and so on and so forth. Male cubs at about three do not have a choice. They have to disperse. It means they have to leave the pride in which they were born. If they don't do it on their own, their mothers and other members of the pride, adult females of the pride, will make sure that they are um, just one second. Okay, uh, not for me. Um, uh, they are, you were, you were last when you said they are. So can you please repeat? Okay, no, I just saw some chat pop up. So that's why I got distracted. Oh, right. anyway, oh sorry. Okay. Uh, so these males at the age of three, if they don't disperse on their own, the pride females will, will aggressively behave themselves, including their mothers, simply because they are now reproductively uh, mature. They don't want uh, these males to be breeding either with their mothers, grandmother, or aunts, or cousins, and so on and so forth. Now look at a scenario where a litter, or let's say two litters of three cubs each are born. So you have six cubs born. And let's take an average of 50-50 sex ratio. So you have three females, three males. Now, these three males, and typically cub survival is about 50% in the first year. So let's assume three of these animals die and you're left with one male and two females. At the age of three, the lone male is left with no choice. He has to leave. The females at the age of three are also reproductively mature, have a choice. They can either continue to stay in their natal pride, N-A-T-A-L, natal pride meaning the pride in which they were born, or they can disperse. Very few females choose to disperse. All males have to disperse. Now a single male disperses. He then looks out for one or two other males of his age who have also dispersed more or less at the same time from some other pride. And they tend to meet, they get to know each other. And if things go well, they will form a coalition. They'll spend a year or two gaining in experience, gaining in strength, then scouting the landscape, traveling enormous distances, looking for coalition males which are old, which are weak, and then they will challenge them. And they need to be careful in choosing which males to challenge. Because if they choose strong males to challenge, they will get rebuffed and in the process could even get injured or even killed. But if they choose wisely because of their young, uh, their youth and their strength, they can then push off the older resident males and take over the territory and the pride therein. So this is what happens in lion society. Oops. So as I said, at the age four or five, coalition males attempt pride takeover and then if they're successful, they'll become territorial. What happens to the males that are driven away, which are ousted? So they become nomadic. 
So males have two phases of nomadism. And nomadism beginning at about age three, when they disperse from their natal pride, till about age five, when they take over a pride. And again, from about age eight or nine, when they're ousted from their territory, and then with luck, they might survive a year or two at best, when they have lost their territory and they become nomadic again. In the wild, it is unusual for male lions to survive longer than 10 years. And at best, they can survive only till age 12. Now, the following two slides give you a wonderful flow chart which illustrates what happens in lion society, uh, both to males as well as to uh, females. This is put together from data from Africa because Africa has had wonderful long-term research on lions, more or less nonstop from 1960s, early 1960s. And that's the only way we can understand ecology of these species. Uh, unfortunately, in India, we haven't still recognized the value of long-term systematic research. And uh, there is a tendency for the government to want to control the information when it comes to species, endangered species especially, because they feel that anything seen as slightly negative uh, is somehow not to be known to the public which actually works against the well-being of these species because unless you recognize problems early, we will not be able to address them. But let's go through these flow chart. So the female cub is born and at the age of three or four, she has the option either to integrate with her mother's pride or to disperse. And as I said, most females will integrate. She is reproductively active from age three till about 11. And at about age 18, she would die. Obviously, captive lions live long, much longer because they get food, they don't have to hunt, they don't have to fear other pressures on them, they have a veterinary doctor looking after them and so on and so forth. But uh, the record, I think, for captivity is some 25 or 26, but that's not good for these animals. Uh, that old lion actually was like a back with a curved spine, it could barely move, it could barely eat and so on. So anything over 15 is a really old animal. So that is the flow chart for females. Let's look at what the flow chart for males is. Again, born at three years, they have to disperse and between four and five is when they form a coalition and then they go look for prides with weak males. They tend to establish territory in Africa, their tenure in a Pride is only two or three years when the next wave of younger males would come and push them away. And then they again have a nomadic phase uh, of about uh, two to four years and then they die. So significant difference in lifespan of wild male lions and wild lionesses. Males living only about 10 to 12 years and females having potential to live about 18 years. Here you see a picture of an adult male and Email. Uh, this is a very typical behavior called flemen, F-L-E-H-M-E-N. You see the male line, the wrinkled uh, jaws, teeth exposed. Uh, you can't see the tongue protruding, but his tongue is protruding, I can tell you. Essentially, he's checking out the reproductive cycling of the female. The female is just sitting and half dozing there. He's trying to sample uh, the aerosol chemicals out there to assess whether she's cycling, whether she's available for mating. For students of zoology, uh, what happens here is then the tongue is curled up and the Jacobson organ is what enables uh, the olfaction uh, uh, and for the animal to determine uh, whether the female is available for mating. When you see an adult male so close to an adult female, it is almost guaranteed that they are a mating pair. Why does this happen? Because a female available for mating is a very valuable resource. And if a male is not next to her to protect her from other males, he is going to lose her. So 
and what is the whole purpose? I mean, essentially, from an evolutionary perspective, all males are trying to pass their genes on to the next generation. And to be able to do that, you need to have access to breeding females. And typically, a mating episode lasts from a minimum of three days to a maximum of about seven days. I should call it a mating session. Let's not call it an episode. During which they can mate sometimes three, four times an hour. And um, normally the first day, there's not much mating. They're just kind of getting to know each other kind of thing. And then the next two, three, four days would be when the bulk of the mating is done. And there would be a day or two after that when they're still hanging out together. And then they'll go their own separate ways. But this time is also filled with tension. And you can see the aggression between the male and the female here. And you can see the kind of movements. It's very stylized. It's very tense. Uh, they both are attracted to each other. At the same time, there is a certain level of uh, repelling force also acting there. So the actual act of copulation, and you can see the size difference. You see how big the male is compared to the female. And that puts the female technically at risk because if the male wanted, he could just bite the back of her head or back of the neck and the female would be gone. And hence that tension. And typically each copulation would last about 30, 40 seconds at best. And as soon as the male uh, ejaculates, the female would turn around and slap the male if he hasn't gotten on. So you, you can see again a picture there and so it, you see that tension. And so at the end of three, four days, uh, the adult male will often have scratches and bleeding injuries on his head and face. The gestation period is about 110 days. You can see that cubs are born throughout the year, but the bulk of the cubs are kind of born really March to August, which is kind of the late winter, summer, and monsoon. And there's something driving this, which is essentially water. Um, bulk of the mating is taking place in winter, and bulk of the cubs are born during late winter, summer, and monsoon. Because lionesses in a pride tend to synchronize their breeding. So if there are three, four females, almost all of them would mate at the same time, around the same time, would give birth to cubs around the same time. And what that enables is for one female to stay back, look after the cubs, and the rest of the pride can go out and hunt. Because just sitting with the cubs is not going to give food. But the lions are also smart. Bulk of these sites where they give birth are often close to water sources. And since they give birth in late summer, late winter and summer, water is already a restricted resource. And because water is restricted, the prey tends to congregate around water holes. And if you are found around water holes, if you're denning around water holes, then access to prey also improves. You also see that the litter size, you know, we have data for 10 litters, the total number of cubs were 23. So the average litter size is about 2.3. And as I said, the first year, it is quite normal and natural for about 50% of the cubs to die. And that's the way evolution works. There's nothing to uh, worry about. There is also infanticide taking place in lions, not just in Asian lions, it happens in African lions also. We talked about how young males looking to establish territories would oust territorial males. And after ousting, if they find young cubs which are still suckling their mothers, these new males will do their best to try and kill the cubs. The females will, of course, try and defend the cubs. Why do they do this? These cubs were sired by the males which have been ousted. So the new males had no interest in protecting them. And if the cubs continue to suckle, the females are not going to be available for mating. And their time in the pride is limited to two or three years. So the males are doing this 
to accelerate the availability of females for mating, and then to mate with them, pass on the genes, raise the cubs successfully, so that by the time they get ousted, they have raised at least a few cubs which contain their genes. The data, these data I'm presenting is from my PhD student, uh, Dr. Meena Venkatraman, and uh, she did her field work in the early 2000s. And uh, for the year 2002, 2003, there was a significantly high uh, mortality due to infanticide. Of the uh, cub deaths recorded, 55% was due to infanticide. Males will carry injuries. It's not unusual at all. Nothing to get worried about because males are either mating and therein getting injured by females or they're defending their pride, defending their territory, some of which also involves fighting other males. They have natural ability to heal themselves. They can keep licking and keeping their wounds clean or fellow coalition males who help them with that. And they, they that way very robust creatures. Bulk of the waking hours, the male lines are walking and patrolling their habitat. As I said, uh, male territories can range from 100 to 150 square kilometers. So that's a very large piece of real estate. And they need to constantly move and make sure that that piece of land is not intruded upon by other males. So if it's a large coalition, let's say a coalition of five animals, they often would split up um, two, two males somewhere, two, males, two or three males somewhere else, so that they are much more effectively patrolling. But if it's a two male coalition, invariably, they would stick uh, together. Lions prefer to use man-made pathways like this road that you see here, simply because it is soft dust. There are seldom uh, leaf litter or thorns and it gives you a clear line of sight. And fortunately, this also benefited my field work. So when I go looking for lions, I can see their tracks on the ground and thereby I'm able to track them and find them. What is the objective of all this patrolling and defense? Really access to females for mating to produce cubs, which will carry their genes. Yeah, that you saw one line of suckling, here's another line of slightly older cubs. How do they do this? One is the physical act of walking, patrolling. The other is they have two signaling systems. One is roaring. Here you see a male lion sitting and roaring. Male lions can sit and roar, male lions can lie down and roar, uh, male lions can walk and roar, male lions can stand up and roar. So they seem to be able to roar in all kinds of situations. And they they would largely roar from about one hour before sunset till about two hours after sunrise. So during the cooler and night time is when uh, they roar. And they would, territorial males would roar very, very regularly, three to four times every hour. And the message of the roar is different depending on who is the recipient, who's listening to this roar. Let's assume this male line is part of a three male coalition and today he's alone. And when he is roaring, the two other members of his coalition are listening to his roar and they can recognize each other's voice, by the way. They are recognizing, okay, our, our brother is doing fine. He's announcing his presence. We know where he is now. And they would always uh, invariably roar back. That way, they, this male line knows where the other males are. What about males which are not part of his coalition. The signaling there is very, very different. It's essentially telling, beware, watch out. I am strong. I am in charge of my territory. I am strong enough and robust enough to roar four or five times every hour. If you mess with me, there's a cost to pay. So that's the message going out to non-coalition males. The message to the pride members, which are the females and their offspring is, relax, carry on with your life. We are in charge, we will defend you. Females also roar, but they don't roar quite as regularly and often as the males. So 
you have one signaling system which is voice based which is roaring which is a short duration because each roar will last about 45 seconds and then there is silence but long distance if it is a calm day and if a lion is in a slightly elevated space um, you can hear it for 5 kilometers so it's a very very long signal very very long uh, distance signal the other signaling is this scent marking here you can see a male lion squirting urine and it has pheromones which is a bunch of chemicals and again like the roar which can be recognized by other lions the chemical signal the pheromone signal is also unique to each individual animal so these are visiting cards one is a short duration long distance visiting card while the scent marking is a short distance but longer duration visiting card by this i mean so a lion in both these cases as you see they are going towards trees uh, which are on the side of a path or leaning or even rocks and when a lion is patrolling and marking um, with experience i could more or less predict every 10 15 meters depending on the way the tree was or the rock was yeah that's where he'll go on scent mark because they are looking for slightly sheltered places not necessarily exposed to the sun or rain so that the chemical signal is not washed away easily now what happens is the lion has scent mark and then gone on any other lion coming by can smell the scent mark and recognize whether it's my coalition mate or my or uh, the male which is defending my territory or this is indeed a male i need to be careful about because he is actively patrolling and he is actively scent marking if for instance this line becomes weak or injured and is not able to patrol as effectively as in his prime what will happen these scent marks will grow old 10 days 12 days 15 days when new males come and check this out and they don't see the strong scent that tells them that's a signal they get oh the territorial male here seems to have either become weak or died it's our chance let's go and explore that's how the scoping is done by the young males who are looking to take over territory this is a picture from 1987 believe it or not uh, the man Uh, to the right of the image uh, is me. And the person in blue is Dr. A. J. T. John Singh, uh, India's first wildlife biologist, and he was also my PhD guy. We were both at the Wildlife Institute of India at that point of view. And this was the first systematic radio collaring study. You can see the radio collar here. You see the black. Uh, that's the uh, radio transmitter. Then you see the protruding antenna. And in the earlier picture, I had shown you what the collar looks like. I was lucky to be able to radio collar eight lions nine times. Uh, this male lion's co uh, collar was malfunctioning, so we had to recollar. That's how uh, this is. Uh, it was first radio collared in '87, uh, and then in '88 we had to replace this radio collar. What is a radio collar? How does it help us? Look at a radio collar like one of the FM stations. Each radio collar has its unique frequency. it is transmitting regularly signals of course radio collar technology since the 80s have vastly advanced today you can turn on and turn off radio collars remotely to conserve battery you have gps enabled radio collars you don't even have to do field work satellites pick up the radio signals and uh, transmit to your laptop this is especially required for long ranging animals like whales uh, which are often diving thousands of meters and moving hundreds of kilometers so physical radio tracking by individual uh, people is very difficult long uh, distance migrations by birds uh, so it's best to have that kind of technology uh, to capture uh, their movement but lions don't quite while they are long ranging don't move that kind of distance so i was able to track them on foot how we do it we first identify the animal we want to study then tranquilize it by shooting uh, at it with a Goes down. The first job is to make it comfortable in a proper position. So 
that it's able to breathe comfortably, check for external injuries, collect any ectoparasites like ticks and so on, and then check the radio collar, fit the radio collar, weigh the animal, and the way we would weigh it is there used to be a dial balance hanging, hanging from a tree, and then you have essentially a charpoy top, like a wooden frame with ropes tied across, use that like a stretcher, transfer the male, uh, the lion, to the uh, balance, uh, hook it to it, weigh the animal, and then the rest of the crew would disappear. I would wait, uh, observe the animal till it uh, recovered safely, because it's it's not correct to leave a tranquilized animal unattended. Any other animal could come and attack it. And then it would go, get up and go, uh, stay with it for another hour or so. And once it is confirmed that uh, the full effects of the tranquilizer has uh, weaned away, then uh, we would be able to uh, resume our regular track. How was I tracking? I had this box, like imagine it like a transistor, which had a tuning dial. I knew the frequency of each of these collars. I could tune into each collar. And then you had a directional antenna. And because signals were attenuated by vegetation and terrain, and since gear is hilly, I had to keep climbing hills on a regular basis. So every day, a lot of exercise uh, to get on top of hills, try and locate these animals. And then using a compass, uh, home in on each animal that I caught the signal to be able to observe, to find out to which other lines this line has found today, what activity it was doing, where exactly it is. Uh, is it in the riverbed? Is it in uh, a teak forest or a thorn forest or an open grassland? Is it feeding? What, what kind of species and so on? So essentially to build a large body of data. When you do long-term research, individual identification of animals is important. And to be able to track these animals on a regular basis. So uh, even though lines were easily accessible compared to tigers and leopards, without a radio collar, there was no way to be able to track them on a regular basis. Otherwise, you would see them every third day or fourth day, not necessarily on a daily basis. And with this data, we were able to build maps like this. These are all, again, MENA's data. So you were able to put dots on a map, draw, draw the outer boundaries to be able to figure out its territory. In this case, you see where it was born, then it first area it dispersed, then second area, and then third area. When you get a lot more locations, uh, you get, get maps like this. Today, uh, out of the 670 odd animals that the official count is, at least 300 lines are not within Gir forest. So you see this map, which is Gir. 300 lines are found outside the map. You look at the magnified maps of some of these regions, and you realize how fragmented and small these habitats are. The 2005 official numbers tell you only 304 of the 500 odd lines were within the protected area. You find 33 lines here, 80 lines here, 37 and so on and so forth. We should ask the question whether this is good whether this is something that we should encourage and so on and so forth. What does it really translate? Here you see in a village, a couple of motorcyclists in the background and a lion is sleeping in the foreground. You often have lions having to deal with roads, railway tracks, uh, both within the uh, protected area and more so outside the protected area. As a result, it is not a new issue for lions over and knocked on by heavy weight. On an average, at least one lion gets killed either by a train or a heavy vehicle every year. Um, now, SL, you'll have to uh, project the videos for me. Yeah. Starting, starting with the one. Yeah, I will do that. I will. I will. Are ya, are ya, are ya! Oh, hey, Dave! Hey, Dave!
बच्चू बन कर जो हेलो लो मो हाव तो Yeah, that's it, Yasser. The next video is later. Okay. You you have to stop sharing. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So the whole idea in showing these videos is to give you all a reality check of what it means for lions living outside the forest. It means navigating traffic. it means navigating people it means living primarily of livestock livestock which can be deceased livestock which is sometimes stray sometimes owned by people and you saw how people were crowding around lions driving so close to them this in many ways is a ticking time bomb it is waiting for a disaster to happen and these disasters can take multiple routes one of which is lions can start attacking people and there are lions attacking people but nowhere near how high it could potentially be or lions could catch diseases because there is no way we know what the public health situation the environmental health situation in our country is and if these lions are primarily living in human dominated habitats interacting with people and their livestock you can well imagine what risks that there are going to be so go back to that one graph that i showed you where the government is quite proud to say that they have lions today in 30000 square mile square kilometers 28500 square kilometers is human dominated habitat this is habitat that has at least 300 if not more lions and it doesn't mean these lions only stay outside these lions are going to occasionally come in interact with lions in the forest similarly lions in the forest are going to occasionally go out and interact with lions uh, which are found outside the forest and what does that mean in terms of conservation what does it mean in terms of management what does it mean in terms of conservation risk are all questions we need to be a bit of a reflection on what is i mean it's a fairly loosely used word all of us um, it's like cricket in india almost everybody has an opinion on wildlife conservation in india this is primarily a set of questions i like to ask myself and i thought it will be relevant to also um, discuss this today what is conservation 
Is it about individual animals or is it about populations? To me, it's really about populations because what is the only guarantee in the life of every individual, including you and me? Death. So we are born to die. But populations need to persist. So if we focus too much on the conservation of an individual, we lose the plot. We really need to be focusing on conservation of populations. And anyway, conserving a single individual will not enable the long-term conservation of the species. To enable long-term conservation, you need to be able to focus on conservation of populations. Now, how do you conserve population? One way, which is very, very critical and important, is habitats. Unlike you and me, animals cannot live in multi-storied apartments. I mean, they, they don't get into crowded kind of situations, especially territorial species like lions. So without habitats, we cannot have populations. And habitats for lions need to be of the order of eight to thousand square kilometers to be really effective. Small bits of eight square kilometers here, 10 square kilometers here, 100 square kilometers there is not going to serve purpose. Now, individual lines we know, we discussed females will live maximum 18 years in the wild, males about 10 or 12 years. So what are the time frames we need to work? Typically conservation science. Career time frame. Don't forget evolution that we all really need to be concerned about and within which ecology is set, works on a much, much longer uh, time frame. What is conservation about? Is it about wild animals and nature? Actually, conservation is really about people because nature left to itself knows how to manage itself. It doesn't need intervention. It's because in the last two centuries, especially, and more in the last 50, 60 years, with accelerating climate change, with accelerating habitat loss, habitat fragmentation, habitat degradation, is where conservation has become recognized as a very important human endeavor. If not for biodiversity's sake, if not for nature's sake, for our own well being's sake. But unfortunately, in human society, it is often the powerful, the, the, the political class, the rich class that drives conservation. Very often trampling on issues of local community rights, justice, and inclusiveness. So the costs of conservation are borne by local communities, the poor and the weak, and the benefits are reaped by people like us. Uh, who often never go hungry to bed, who have always a roof over our head, who have jobs and so on and so forth. And we live in urban, our lifestyle places pressure on nature, but the cost is transferred on to local communities who often are living reasonably in sync with nature. Now, I haven't quite uh, told the story of the lion from a conservation perspective to know. But I did while introducing say that today, the only population of wild lions in Asia, not just in India, in Asia is restricted to gear and its surrounding habitats. I often equate this to a situation of all your eggs in one basket. And what does it mean? High risk. If the basket falls, irrespective of whether you have 5, 50, 500 eggs, the chances are that all the eggs would break. That's really what drove the Wildlife Institute to appoint me and to send me to Gear to do my PhD research, which was to get an update on the ecology of the species to inform a conservation action, which is called translocation of lions, which is to move a bunch of lions from Gear and release them in another wild habitat, not in a captive situation, so that you have a second free ranging population of lion. What does it do? It reduces risk. It's like buying life insurance or medical insurance. All of us buy life and medical insurance, not because we expect to fall sick or die, but in case something happens, there is a safety net. So the whole idea of translocation is exactly like that, to provide a safety net for these wild lions. And this is not a doomsday scenario. 
This is because risks are recognized by conservation scientists. And the, unfortunately, these risks are translated into real action, uh, even in Gave now. Last year, in the first five months, 92 lions had died in Gave. In 1994, the largest lion habitat is the Serengeti Mara system in Tanzania and uh, Kenya. It's about 25,000 square kilometers. It has about 3,000 lions. In 1994, if I remember correctly, there was an outbreak of a disease called canine distemper virus. A thousand lions died in three or four weeks. Okay, Gir is only 1,500 square kilometers of protected habitat. The government can say 30,000 square kilometers, but you saw what kind of habitat that is. And as kind of predicted, in 2018, September and October, lions started dying. There was canine distemper diagnosed. Unfortunately, the whole response was to hush up the information. Um, we do know some bits and pieces, uh, uh, but we expect at least 30, 40 lions died in next to no time. Another 30, 40 lions were taken into captivity saying they will treat it, inoculate it. <laughs> but for years now, they're all in captivity. Once you take an animal from its habitat for more than a week, it's very difficult to release it back. So on completion of my PhD research, armed with that ecological information, we did a survey of potential sites for translocating lions, based on which Kuno Wildlife Sanctuary in Northwestern Madhya Pradesh bordering Rajasthan was chosen. The sanctuary gets its name Kuno from the perennial river that you see, which is a major tributary for the Chambal River system. Very varied habitats. Here you see bamboo, extensive grasslands. But at that time, and this is 93, 94, this is also habitat having quite extensive grazing and a lot of people. So based on which uh, we gave a recommendation and uh, that the habitat needs to be consolidated. Some 800 square kilometers has to be given the status of a national park and then in, uh, managed well for prey population to come and then lines could be translocated. In 2012, uh, no, in 2008 or something, uh, a public uh, spirited citizen filed a public interest litigation in the Supreme Court. Then in 2012, I was approached by the Supreme Court, the forest bench of the Supreme Court to serve as an expert witness. So between February and June of 2012, almost every week I was flying between Bangalore to Delhi to be present in court. To, to hear what was being said and to answer any questions and to submit a couple of reports at the request of the forest bench. What was the PIL about? In, 2000, in 1995, Government of India started the process of line translocation based on our recommendation in Kuno. But till 2006, there was no attempt at translocating. So the PIL basically said, why is it not happening? More than 20 villages have been moved. Several hundred families have been moved. Several crores of rupees has been spent. How come the lines have not yet been translocated? It was essentially a political decision. Gujarat was opposed to translocation, not on ecological grounds, but on political and regional grounds. And the court gave a very, very nuanced, very strong judgment. It basically said, on 15th of April 2013, that within six months, lines have to be translocated from Gir to Kuno in letter and spirit. It invoked the relevant articles of the Indian constitution, strongly supported the role of the National Board for Wildlife, which was the body, which is the apex body uh, for wildlife conservation in India, and which was promoting the translocation of lines. This was an important agenda of the national, then National Wildlife Action Plan. And it said very clearly, no state, organization, or person can claim ownership or possession over wild lines in the forest, wild animals in the forest. So again, it goes, I mean, these are verbatim quotes from the judgment. Uh, so it's, it gave me a lot of hope saying, okay, here we now have the judgment, very strong, very clear, 
saying that it's really the species' best interest that needs to be kept in mind, not any other consideration. And I was hopeful. But what has happened today? I did the judgment. There was supposed to be an expert committee appointed. It was appointed by the judgment. I'm a member of that. And that committee hasn't met since December of 2016. Who knows ready? 24 villages, 1,543 uh, families have been relocated. Prey base has come. A national park has been established and management capacity has been tremendously improved. In 2012, uh, not in 2012, in 2016, uh, uh, a contempt petition was filed saying your 2013 judgment is still not uh, enacted. And uh, it went on for a couple of years. And in March, 2018, uh, the government basically said, we'll hold a meeting. Uh, and the contempt petition was also dismissed and it's in stalemate. And unfortunately in September, October, we had the line mortalities in game. Uh, the last video, uh, yes. Thank you, sir. That was a video of an African lion dying due to canine distemper virus. It's a short clip. In the beginning, you see uh, what looks like an extremely healthy animal. It's, it's, it's big, it's well-fed, it's able to move. But look how quickly the virus acts. It's a matter of minutes. And that's what can happen to lions if they get that disease. But unfortunately, we seem to be... Oops, I seem to... Oh, one second, sorry. Now, shifting gears just the last concluding part to give you a sense of what wildlife conservation is really happening in India. This is a leopard falling off, jumping off a three-story or four-story engineering college. This is local people taking law into their hands when they find that conflict levels are not arrested, when they find management not And this is also an expression of reverence. Even though the leopard has been killed, you can see blood dropping there. But look at that old woman. Look at the manner in which she's interacting with this animal. And that to me today is really the magic of India. Most Indians, not necessarily conservationists, so-called conservationists, have a positive attitude toward nature. It is part of our culture, it is part of our religion. And that's what has enabled us to conserve. Because if we were to only focus on our protected areas, 50% of our lions, 50% of our tigers, more than 50% of our elephants, large percentage of many of our other endangered species live their lives not within protected areas, but outside of protected areas. So if people are not accommodative of not able to coexist and tolerate wild nature in their midst, our wildlife conservation will not succeed. But unfortunately, 
our official conservation policies and plans believes in excluding people. But that's a story for another day. Last half a dozen slides. This is my first photograph of a lion, December of 1985. I grew up in Madras. I got exposed to nature in my late teens, early 20s. But much of it was really restricted to Gidi National Park and Adyar Estuary and so on. And slowly made trips into Mudamalai, Anamalai, Mandandurai, Kalakad, and so on and so forth. Then I went to AVC College as part of my coursework. There was a lot of field work to be done. And there's a dissertation in my final semester, which I studied Langurs and uh, Mandandurai Plateau. So slowly I was getting field experience. But I hadn't really worked with large cats. When I joined the Wildlife Institute, I was lucky to get this opportunity to study lions. And in those days, the bulk of the guidance really was, oh, okay, here is an animal, here is what the questions are. You kind of go and set up a field base and start your work. I did study Hindi in school, so I had some knowledge of the language, but um, not much spoken Hindi. And in Gujarat anyway, in, in Sasan especially, in that Gir forest, they speak a dialect of Gujarati called Katiawadi. So for the four days I was there, I had a local village boy as my guide. The first three and a half days went by. I saw lion tracks, I, law, I saw lion droppings, I heard them roar at night, I saw their kill remains, but I was not able to see a single animal. And I was beginning to have second thoughts on my decision to quit a marketing career and get into wildlife research. Because if you can't see your animal, how are you supposed to study it? This was my final evening. We were walking, sun was about to set, and out of the bush, about 100 meters away from me, four lions emerged, and I was scared. So in my broken Hindi, I asked this guy what we should do. He said, just keep quiet, chup. So I held my breath, stood still, and these lions kept coming. But uh, now I can tell you these were young females. Uh, they were not interested in us. They were playing, they were swatting each other, and they were going about their business. Took me some time to recognize that I was carrying binoculars and camera, and I should really be focusing on observing these animals and taking pictures. So here is this picture of a lion about to disappear. My first image, but something I'm very proud of. It took me about six months to do this. This is me in the foreground and three lions in the background. And the only reason I had to do this was to be able to observe them from close distance, to be able to identify them. How would I identify? by cuts in their ear, by scars on their body or face, and by their whisker spot pattern. See, tigers have stripes, leopards have spots, lions have no body markings, but they have three or four rows of whiskers, and these spots are arranged in a unique manner for each animal, more or less like a fingerprint. So I had to get close, to be able to draw these, and then be able to identify them. I've already told you how special these animals are, the kind of access they would give. Here is a subadult male radio collared lion sleeping in a hot afternoon, uh, tongue stuck out, basically panting away. I crept up slowly. I took a photograph, and that was this. Hearing the camera shutter go, look at the, the reaction. I mean, not of aggression, but of curiosity. Here's my final photograph of a lion, adult lion sleeping. I'm taking the picture under my own shadow in the frame. That gives you a sense of how close I was. All of this is just to convey how special these animals are, what kind of access I used to have. And this is something I will not do these days, but don't get the wrong impression that every line you see, you can walk up and do this. Um, that, that's not a smart thing to do at all. Very often, these were time-consuming efforts. You negotiate, you move slowly, you keep observing the animal. And why did I do this? I was young and silly. That's the only explanation I can give, some of which did involve research, but this was also fun. These are things that used to provide me with a lot of enthusiasm and inspiration. This is also conservation in India. This is the border of the National Park and Wildlife Sanctuary, two wild lions walking. What do you see? The public. I never tire about talking about lions simply because this is a story that more Indians need to hear. They need to engage with its conservation because conservation cannot become just 
a subject area for the specialist. The public, the interested public, the educated public, educated not in terms of formal degrees, but educated in terms of understanding India's biodiversity, nature, and the conservation challenges, have to take part in this conservation endeavor. Otherwise, we will not succeed. And I just hope that this story inspires some of the audience, they get interested, and they tell this to others, and this is not a road to extinction for the species. I've only spoken primarily about lions, but Gir is also a land of million sunrises and sunsets. Many of us living in urban India today are not lucky enough to experience these visual delights that nature has to offer. Thank you very much. I gratefully acknowledge the support I got from the Gujarat Forest Department, my student, my wonderful bunch of field assistants, institutional support from Wildlife Institute of India, and some of the photographer friends, Manoj Dolakya, Kayan Varma, Sanjay Gubi, Yogendra Shah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ravi Shalam. Uh, it was a uh, new uh, dimension to living itself rather than wi just wildlife. Uh, for me, it was, it was a, a kind of a revelation about you know how uh, wildlife uh, is in the in the wilds as well as in the uh, amongst the humans and. Uh, I, I, I would like to ask you a question about how uh, lions behave uh, when they become suddenly you know, cranky and uh, amongst them uh, in, a, in a pride or uh, when there is a group of say three, four male lions, will, will they fight each other and they will get killed or some things like that? Not within a coalition, but they, there is a lot of aggression. I mean, food is a scarce resource, females are a scarce resource, they will share, but Females, they will not share. They will share food because there is strength in numbers. So if you have to fight another bunch of males, you need your coalition mate. If you don't share your food, they're not going to come and fight with you. But females, uh, very often in coalition, the males are related, which means that uh, if your brother is mating, some of your genes are also passing on. So yeah. in large coalitions, only one or two males would mate. If it's a two-male coalition, matings are more or less equally split. But Males would fight even within a coalition. They get irritated, but it's not a serious fight. It's not a fight to kill, but there can be aggression. Males will even fight with females. Females would fight with females. If cubs are annoying, they would swat at each other and so on and so forth. But the serious fights are meant with strange males who are challenging their territory. And uh, that, does it happen during the mating period when you know some other male out of the coalition tries to uh, mate with a uh, Female. So that's like, I mean, that means that the resident territorial male coalition is not in control. If it's in control, there should be no chance ah, for a strange what, male to have access to pride females. Go for any questions? Uh, yeah, I that presentation was just amazing. It was eye opening. This, uh, you know, we tend to make a lot of assumptions, and this was, you know, cleared up a lot of cobwebs. It was very, very illuminating. Thank you for that. Uh, I had like, a couple of, I had a personal question and then we'll, I'll have a technical question. When you, the, some of those photographs, I mean, five feet away, 10 feet away, that's uh, it's just mind numbing. It's, it's, it's just mind blowing to even think about it. If you are very lucky, I think that, that the lions, you know, decided to just, you know, give you a kind of a casual look or something like that. Did you have a chance if they decided to attack you? See, as I said, uh, these are obviously frozen in time. Um, you don't see the effort that went into getting into a position for me to take that picture. The education I had myself, learnings I had in understanding, interpreting lion behavior. And then, see, I wouldn't do this with every lion I saw, yeah. right? Uh, I would judge its behavior. I mean, it's... This is something often asked. Don't you feel frightened? Uh, weren't you attacked? Uh, I was charged. I was charged about two dozen times. But there was only once that I really felt my life was in danger. Uh, and that was because I was stupid. It was twilight, very early morning, like 5, 5.15. The sun hadn't even risen. It was really starlight and moonlight. 
I had seen a main line walk off the road. I got off the jeep and started following it. For whatever reason, and I was keeping about 25, 30 meter distance. And that you know by all these images is a fairly safe distance to keep. And the line was walking away from me. So it was not even walking towards me. Suddenly the main line decided to stop, turn around. I stopped. Then I saw the ears flatten and the tensing of the line body. And I realized, boss, be careful. There is something going on here. And without any warning, no growling, nothing, he started charging at me. I was very, very lucky. I was at the base of a hill. I just ran. I didn't look back, nothing. I wouldn't recommend anybody to run away from a line simply because a line is always going to be faster than you can be. Uh, and with fear, your legs won't work, you will trip, you will fall, all those things can happen. And the minute you are fallen, you're dead. Uh, we have the advantage of height. When you stand up, you know, we are taller than a line and that gives us a profile. And typically on the 24 odd other occasions I was charged, I just stood up and we always carry a stick or a little ax and shout and wave and make your profile much larger than it is. And that tends to keep these animals away. And also lions being social, you're looking at one line. God knows how many other lines are behind you or on the side of you. You know, all of those considerations. The mistake I did was I went alone. Typically, I would have at least one field assistant with me. Very often two, maybe three field assistants. So when you see these pictures I'm taking, there's a field assistant standing behind me to ensure, because when you look through a camera, you lose perspective, right? You, you don't know really the distance at which these animals are and so on and so forth. So I went alone. I went when it was not yet light. And it was one of those things. God knows what was happening in the mind of that line that day. In most other cases, I could explain. I would turn a bend in a river and there would be a bunch of lions sitting there. And obviously they are startled, I am startled. Half of them run away, half of them stand up and growl and so on and so forth. Uh, there are occasions when I probably got too close with a lioness with cubs and so on and so forth. But this is the only occasion where I felt threatened. But as I ran up the hill, this line stopped, didn't chase me up the hill, just stood. I didn't go back and uh, try to work with him. I just went back uh, to the chief. Are they friendly? Kind of? Oh. Because now, you said social, they're only social amongst their species, not with others, right? Obviously, I mean, uh, the so see, we have a perception because we're intelligent, learned, and so on, and nuanced about other species. For them, it is functional. Their relationship with prey is how can I catch the prey, right? Uh, their relationship with, say, poisonous snakes is how I can avoid poisonous snakes because they know with experience that you don't mess with poisonous snakes. But if it's a python, if it's a large enough python, they will happily kill it and eat it. If it's a crocodile, if they can catch it on land, they'll happily kill it and eat it. For them, animal protein is animal protein. There's this other myth talking of what Gopu is saying that lions and tigers will only eat uh, kill, prey that they have killed. Nonsense. As I told you, if given a chance, they will steal every day a kill from a leopard. Because hunting is not easy. Ha hunting is expensive energy-wise, is fraught with risk. The, the forest floor, who knows where the thorn is, where the rock is, where the gully is, where there's a hole, your leg can get caught. And no prey animal is waiting to be killed. Prey animals have hoofs, they have horns, they have antlers, porcupine has quills. You know, they all have their defense mechanisms. So lions have to be smart. So typically, 20%, one in five hunts succeeds. So the majority of their hunts do not succeed. So talking about friendly, I don't think the lions ever recognize me as Ravi. Unlike your pet dog or pet cat or something like that. Uh, yeah. I do think they recognize my behavior as non-threatening. That I am not threatening them. There have been a few occasions when I've sat so close to them and they are roaring, I've felt their spittle and bad breath on my face. I mean, not a pleasant experience, but just to give you in some sense yeah, the yeah. access uh, that uh, you can have. I don't think 
you can call them friendly in that sense. I mean, I do keep using the word within quotes, user friendly. I mean, you can't take the kind of pictures <laughs> I've taken unless you have access to those animals. But that's yeah. something that I don't recommend any anybody else. I won't do it now. I am not in the field. I don't know those animals. They th Several things have happened since I left in 1990. And I'm much older man. I have other responsibilities. I mean, I was young and silly at that point of time. Thank Hope you. you had one more question. Uh, the actually you kind of partly addressed it, but let me ask again: Why if so? The lion was widespread, not just through India, but through a lot large part of Asia. But today it's confined only to the Gir forest and uh, some parts of Africa. Uh, why so? Why only one sanctuary? Why not more sanctuaries? Why not have? I believe there are three or four tiger sanctuaries in India, right? Rampambore. And... India has more than 55 designated tiger reserves. Um, and tigers are found uh, almost from Kanyakumari to the foothills of the Himalayas, from Rajasthan to Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, there are majority of the states of India have tigers. The There are two parts to your question. Why did they disappear? Primarily human action. Till about the early 1800s, say till about 1850 also, lions were found throughout much of Asia. Firearms came. And once firearms came, people were able to hunt lions much more effectively. Why and how? Lions live in groups. So if you see one lion, you see many lions. Lions tend to prefer flatter and more open habitats compared to tigers and leopards here. So flatter and more open habitats are much more accessible by people. And so you see between 1850 and 1888, the distribution of lions gets restricted from entire North and Central India to give. So in, a, in about four or five decades, this is what people were able to do, right? So that's what should have happened in Iraq, Iran. We don't have that kind of good record that we have from India. Now to so answer the other question, why not more than one sanctuary? That is the whole idea of translocation. It is, it is foolish, highly risky, and unlawful in light of the 2013 Supreme Court judgment not to translocate lines. We have identified Kono in Madhya Pradesh. It's 800 odd square kilometers, national park, well protected, well managed, ready, waiting for lions. But the intransigence of the government of Gujarat, wanting to be exclusive, wanting to hold on to all the lions, is putting the species at risk. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Uh, Dr. Ravi Chalam, uh, this is Raman, and thanks a lot for the lovely presentation and the photos. Uh, um, I believe many of these photos must have been taken using a film camera, and I can understand uh, the kind of effort that should have gone into taking these photos. So thanks a lot, lovely photos. Uh, I wanted to ask some questions, but the second half of the presentation, you shared or answered all of them, particularly about the uh, location or relocation of the lions to various places because I have been following up on the uh, certain parts of the cases and um, um, so I, you answered that once again thanks a lot for that and uh, there is one particular uh, uh, point that you mentioned about the reverence people have for animals the traditional reverence uh, that stood out and uh, do you do you see a link between the fairly successful tiger conservation program in South India uh, to that, that is part number one. And is there a relationship between uh, economic development of an area and uh, um, conservation doing pretty well in that area? That's question number two. See, um, I think tiger conservation, like any large mammal conservation, first requires habitat. Hmm. South India is lucky in that we have the Western Ghats. It's more or less a continuous uh, yes. uh, hill, uh, uh, mountain system uh, from say uh, southern uh, Gujarat all the way down to Kanyakumari. 
and there are a series of protected areas including tiger reserves along the western ghats there are such patches in central india but rest of india doesn't quite have a network of protected areas because if you isolate them into smaller and smaller habitats and they are unable to move between habitats inbreeding will happen and long term survival of the population gets affected of course protection is important but equally important is integrating local communities into your conservation model because okay. local communities will always outnumber conservationists forest department people and they are there 24/7 yes right and having them on your side is not only the right thing to do but also the right thing to do from a conservation perspective yes we cannot we cannot elevate conservation above justice and laws of this country today we have the forest rights act we cannot say a lion or a tiger is bad, is more important than a local tribal that is very racist very classist uh, you know it's it's people like you and me who never go hungry or saying that these are people really having such a small carbon footprint right i mean they don't they don't zoom and do ethics like this <laughs> they just yeah. getting by on a daily basis so yes. that that is a major uh, challenge so that is on the uh, people's relationship and so on and so forth sorry ramana can you remind me what the second question was yeah about the economic development and ah, success yeah. of conservation yeah now you would expect people with reasonable economic means not to endanger wildlife right because there is no incentive but if you look at some of our i mean not just india uh, worldwide the better uh, economically developed prosperous countries and their state of wildlife you will be surprised because our current economic model is based on growth without limits growth that i mean a company is not supposed to have succeeded if it hasn't grown by a certain percentage every quarter that is not environmentally sustainable that is not ecologically possible right on india that way i mean i've been talking about lions since now the mid 80s and every time i have a foreign audience they just can't believe they think i am lying i mean within quotes because they can't imagine a country of whatever nearly a billion then and more than a billion now with more than 50% of the population depending on the land on the biomass which is still you know agricultural and so on uh, or or livestock grazing and just getting by forest produce collection and us succeeding in conservation a lion population tiger population leopard population elephant population rhino name it almost all our large mammal populations are going up that is only because there is something special about how indian communities as indians and I'm, i'm not talking of urban people here i'm talking of people who live on the land and the manner in which they they relate to land not all communities are like that there have been large cases of poaching poaching some parts of the northeast hunting is very much integral to their culture you know there are challenges i let's not uh, uh, brush away those uh, problems uh, but without that ability that connection that reverence that acceptance that tolerance whatever how much ever money you put in you can't conserve using guns not in india perfect perfect i think think that answers uh, answers it and i can relate to uh, some of the photos that i have seen but uh, then uh, um so yeah that 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 answers it the, the reason why i asked about the economic development part is with respect to tigers i have been told that if tigers hunt and livestock uh, the government immediately pays off uh, pays off a uh, 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 certain amount uh, in places like karnataka so it uh, keep the people settled and not unduly worried about the losses so that's what i had heard that is why i linked the economic uh, development of the place and the uh, like uh, the tiger or any animal conservation growth so that's a so compensation that's scheme yeah. that's a compensation yes. scheme but the bigger problem is it's really not cattle loss the bigger problem is agricultural loss 
imagine a herd of elephant walking through your field they don't have to feed anything they just have to walk through your field then there are pigs then there are monkeys then there are birds you know there is a whole host of animals there are deer there are antelopes you know all kinds of animals can come and cause havoc but our conflict perception is very different in a bangalore apartment your cctv captures a leopard then there is conflict the leopard has not done anything to you it has just gone by but you are causing conflict for these people they every day they are having to encounter a series of wild animals they are not looking at it as conflict right and we don't recognize as much the agricultural loss it's only when people are attacked or people are attacked the more dramatic yes. uh, element unfortunately the compensation scheme can be i mean it can be improved much more it is very top down driven supposing i lose my cattle i have to go to the nearest forest department to report which oh, means okay. i i can't graze my cattle today right so i i have to yeah. go uh, and then i have to prove that the cattle was killed and so on and so forth so there it needs to okay. be improved a lot but from economic development perspective there are a lot more alternative development uh, possibilities in general tourism is a big one uh, if we can involve more and more local populations local in uh, sharing the revenues of tourism in in enabling them providing education okay. opportunities the more better education and health opportunities we provide these people will move out on their own there is no need for us to force them to yes. move perfect uh, answers answers a uh, lot um, and uh, one thing i just want to recall is i read about uh, a tiger having traveled all the way from madhya pradesh to some uh, part in gujarat um, in search of uh, uh, new new location or um, if i if i'm right so that that network of national parks i think it makes lot of lot of idea a uh, lot of uh, sense uh, as far as conservation goes there is more and more data now because we are doing okay. good monitoring of a tiger okay. having moved from bantipur to badra which itself yeah. is about 4 500 kilometers yes a tiger having moved from khana to todoba from todoba to a place in telangana all of which yeah. are involving 5 600 yeah. kilometers yeah and that is where india's development model is creating problem we run these large highways pipelines canals we fragment okay how can tigers navigate those we are not provide we are not even thinking along those lines how do we plan these how do we align these to the extent that highways going through our existing national parks also we want to widen we want higher speed traffic going through forget tigers what happens to insects at night what happen to reptiles at night what yes. happens to slow moving mammals at night yes. if they come on the road i mean there thousands and tens of thousands of animals are getting killed on a daily basis yes. by road kills to um, uh, again uh, thanks a lot i will stop my questions here but uh, extremely engaging presentation um and uh, we will we will carry it on um, youtube uh, i hope lot of people watch it and uh, uh, benefit out of it uh, gopu and uh, yes sir i just yeah, uh, yeah. leave it gopu want to propose a word of thanks i uh, no no go ahead okay so uh, thank you on behalf of uh, uh, rahmira science forum and uh, myself uh, for uh, accepting and you know giving a tremendous uh, insights uh, into the Uh, the entire uh, wildlife uh, ecosystem and you know how uh, uh, it Im- impacts uh, both positively and negatively on uh, human uh, living thank you so much uh, dr ravi thank you uh, to the whole team thank you thank all you all the best Take thank care. you bye bye yeah bye someone you can stop recording yeah yeah i will stop i will stop recording now uh, yeah i do that